So up until this point, we haven't really talked about how to have multiple threads working on a shared problem. So remember, threads are able to share the actual data in our process that's running. And that's where we can get some advantages of improving performance. But we have to be a little bit careful. So I want to go ahead and show you a first task. Perhaps it's a classic example if you've seen threading before of how we can share data and try to improve or optimize some process in our program. But let's see if it actually works. So I'm going to go ahead and refactor one of our previous examples. Again, where we had a Lambda function here to do some work. We created a bunch of threads, and then we made sure that we joined the threads. I'm going to ignore the J thread that we've seen in our previous lesson for now, because I just want to show you working with uh, a shared task here. And the shared task that we're going to do, again, is a classic one. I'm going to have some sort of shared value here, and I'll initialize it to zero, that we're going to have some number of threads increased. So for now, let's just work with 10 threads. That'll be OK. I'm going to refactor this program and remove the work here. And the work that they're going to do is they're going to call some function called shared value increment. And each of the threads are going to take our shared value and increment it by one. OK, so let's update the call that's made from our thread here, shared value. And we should be good to go here. We have a new function here that all of our threads can access because we share the code base. 10 threads are going to be launched, and they're each going to add one to this value, join with the main program when they're done, and then finally we should output the result. So let's go ahead and have our result, shared value, and I'll go ahead and print it out. Okay, so I'll, re I'll compile this program, and oops, looks like I made uh, one error here. So I'll go ahead and fix that because there are no uh, arguments here. So I have to make sure that we don't pass in any. And, and I need to make sure to actually call the function here. Shared value increment. There we are. A few mistakes fixed. And now we can compile. So I'll give you a moment to just look at all of the code so that you can see it's all working. Now, if I go ahead and run this program now after compiling, you'll see that I get 10, and 10, 10, and well, what was this here, this eight here? I was running it pretty fast, but what if I just keep running my program here? Nine, and I'll keep running it, nine, 10 again. Hmm, let's exaggerate this a little bit just to see if this is a problem here, because I'm getting different values here. What if I create 100 threads? And I'll go ahead and increase my number here, recompile, because I've made a change, and shared value of 100, okay, 100 threads, starting from the value of zero and adding. Uh, we should be good to go, right, to release our product here. But I run it again and I get 99. And 100, 99, 100, and 96. Okay, that's a new value. So we can see these values are fluctual. And here lies the problem, though, when working with threads, where we have to be a little bit careful. Since I have this shared value here that's globally accessible, Static makes it accessible to just this CPP file, but it is globally accessible to all of our threads, which are going to execute this function. It's possible that while one thread is reading the value of shared value, another thread is updating. And perhaps the thread that has read shared value is going to update this stale value. Allow me to demonstrate on the whiteboard. So what we've got here is our shared value. And this is a global variable, so all of our threads are accessing it. Thread 0, thread 1, thread 2, etc. Now the idea is that thread 0 might initially read this value and see that its value is 0. Thread 1 at the same time may also read the initial value as 0. If they happen to both be reading or looking at that value at the same time. Now when thread 0 does its update, it's going to do plus equal one here and update our value to one and meanwhile thread zero which had read value uh, of zero here from thread one will also update to one so two threads even though increment has been called twice have only updated the value by one and this is what's called a data race in concurrent program that is the idea that based off of the order that threads access some shared piece of data, you could get a non-deterministic result because it depends on the order of the reads and the writes. 
So again, just to be explicit, if I have shared value equals shared value plus one, one thread could be doing a read here of the initial state here, or rather a read here of initial state. And then it'll start doing the write portion here, where we're doing the plus one and then writing back to update shared value. So again, depending on the interleaving you get, you might get unlucky that two threads are accessing the data at the same time. How do we fix this? Well, in order to fix this, I'm going to go ahead and open up CPP reference and look at our thread support library. So that's down in the bottom right corner. And you'll notice that we have something called a mutex. And if you haven't heard this term before, mutex stands for mutual exclusion. So you have mutually exclusive access. That means one person or entity has exclusive access to some resource. The analogy to this, perhaps it's best drawn, and I'll do it in the corner here, or mute text or mutual exclusion means that one person, and this is a door here, has a key to this door. So they can unlock the door, enter, and then only when they leave, they can give that key to some other person here who is waiting in line. That's the idea with mutual exclusion. Just like having one key to your house and only you can enter and everybody must wait outside. So what does that mean in our threading context? That as thread zero accesses shared state, only thread zero can access this value. Only it can read and write from this shared value. So let's go ahead and look at an example. This will become a little bit more clear. So let's go ahead and see mutex in action. So I'm going to need to include the mutex uh, header here, as indicated by CPP reference. So I'll include mutex. And this is a global variable. That's part of the standard library. And I'll prefix, a, prefix this with g. That's so a global variable. And I'm just going to call it a lock. And now in my function, what I'm going to do is I'm going to call glock.lock. .lock and glock.unlock. And I like to actually indent my code in between just so it's clear that I am locking. Now what lock and unlock do, does, again, lock here, locks the mutex, blocking all the other threads, if that lock is not available. And now all the other threads will essentially be waiting there for that lock to be available. And that unlock uh, subsequently needs to be called here. So let's go ahead and recompile our program. And it compiles. And we're expecting to get a value of, well, if we have 100 threads incrementing a value of 0, we should get 100 every single time, no matter how many times I execute this. And it looks like no matter how many times I run this, it's giving us a consistent or deterministic result. So let me go ahead and up our stakes a little bit. Let's launch a thousand threads because that'll give us a little bit more randomness and increase perhaps our confidence in the code. Although we can never uh, truly prove our code is uh, correct. Um, but this is, looks good to me. So we are getting 1000 every time. And I can clearly see this lock is protecting this shared value. So another way to look at this uh, piece of code here, and I'll leave the code here. and. Um, draw here is that when we have shared value here or some value, let's just call it shared value, and it's protected by this uh, lock here. Oops, let me undo that. So we just have a uh, shared value here. Here we are. Shared value. Good enough. Each of these threads, thread one, or let's start from zero, thread one, thread two, etc., are trying to race to access this particular shared value, which lives inside of the increment shared value function. Now, these threads, if thread zero, or it doesn't really matter, we don't have any control, let's say thread two 
acquires the lock here. All of these other threads are blocked from accessing this value until thread two unlocks the uh, value. So you can think of this as returning the key uh, for this lock to access this section of code. And we'll call this a critical section here. And this means that only one piece of code can access this particular region of code. That is the region that's protected by our locks here. So this here at line 12 is our critical region. And it need not be um, limited to just one line of code. So maybe we have a bunch of lines of code here. All of these regions are protected. And in a way, we can sort of think about this, uh, or the term we think about this in computer science is known as an atomic section of code, because it's the smallest unit that could be accessed. It's indivisible. We can't have any other thread access part of this code because it's protected by this lock. So again, this is the critical section. This is our mutex lock, which allows only one thread to access our code. So in this lesson, you've learned about mutual exclusion or using a primitive known as a mutex. Mutex has another name. It's called a binary semaphore, if you want to do some more research on it. But this is our primitive for enforcing synchronization or only one thread accessing a piece of code. Now, in future lessons, we'll talk about some more of the pitfalls of concurrency and how to deal with them as we move forward. But now you've seen how to fix or set up a shared task and ensure that your concurrent programs will determine the correct result. Now, the one last thing that you may be wondering, and I'll go ahead and visit here, is, well, haven't we essentially slowed down our program? That is true. But assume that we might want to do some other work here, high from thread, and this is just, you know, some silly work here. All of our threads are able to concurrently execute this piece of code. Maybe it's something that we don't care happens in a particular order, or this data isn't shared. Whatever's happening before our lock uh, and uh, after our lock, for instance, can happen out of sequence or without synchronization. But this is the synchronized piece of code or the critical section, which we do want to protect. So I'll leave it there and we'll continue on in the next lesson. Hope you've been enjoying this series. Like and subscribe if you have, and we'll keep looking at some cool stuff.